Hello, I'm Matthew Apro, I'm a medical oncology based in Genelier in Switzerland, and I'm here at the European Breast Cancer Congress in Glasgow, joined by Dan Ria. Yeah, my name is Daniel Ria, I'm a medical oncologist from Birmingham in the UK, uh, and I'm also here in Glasgow at the EBCC, and we're here to discuss some issues regarding uh, uh, molecular diversity of breast cancer. Yeah, Dan, I think that uh, one of the big questions in the past few years has been the definition of uh, the patients that we are treating in order to uh, individualize treatment a little bit better. And uh, w w what are the data uh, concerning the home receptor positive HR2 negative patients out of 100 breast cancer patients? Uh, how many uh, fall in that category? Oh, well, I think it's, I mean, it's a large group. It's the commonest subgroup of, of breast cancers with the uh, conventional subtyping that we do on an everyday basis. So at least 60% uh, of patients would fall into that category. But that's a broad category. And uh, I think that we have now other ways of defining these groups into a little bit more precise subcategories. Can you make a little comment on that? Well, we certainly can. I mean, uh, um, the, the easiest thing to do is, again, use our, our local labs to start looking at things like quantitative uh, uh, hormone receptor expression, KI67 uh, uh, measurement. Of course, that's quite challenging to get the, the quality assurance on the KI67 measurements, but we can, do, we can get some idea. And of course, the, the most important uh, uh, factors uh, that determine prognosis are the traditional things such as size, grade, uh, and uh, obviously nodal involvement. But increasingly now we're recognizing that with molecular tools we can drill down and identify the patients into much more subtle subgroups and the data is emerging slowly that using a number of different platforms uh, we may actually be far more, we may be able to be much more um, discriminating about who we offer different sorts of adjuvant therapies to. Yeah, well, as you know, we have had uh, in the past few years quite a few discussions, uh, including at the St. Gallen consensus meeting on how to use these classic tools and when to use uh, the tools which were emerging at the time and today are not emerging anymore, but they are there and other tools on top of those are emerging. And it's quite difficult actually for the clinician uh, to uh, decide for a certain percentage of these patients how, how to deal with the cancer and what is the best uh, choice of adjuvant treatment. I think everyone agrees that, uh, I should agree in my opinion, that the patients that are highly ER positive, highly PGR positive, uh, have a grade one, uh, possibly grade two tumor and uh, should have a low KI67 therefore. Uh, and uh, are patients that probably benefit basically only from hormonal treatment. But then there's this category of patients which don't fit in this and uh, that's where we really are a little bit stuck. And it's interesting to see and uh, uh, one of the uh, posters here dealt with something that uh, you participate in which is called MAGIC study where we try to understand how colleagues at large in Europe and elsewhere, actually, as we have colleagues from outside of Europe, uh, deal with these questions. Yeah, no, I think that was a, it's a very interesting survey. It's a large survey. It's one of the biggest surveys that, that I've seen looking at how attitudes to uh, the delivery of chemotherapy to patients in this, in this subgroup. And what was interesting about the survey is that it's easy as the kind of patients that you've, that you've mentioned are low grade, high estrogen receptor, high progesterone receptor, low key 67, no negative patient. There's widespread agreement about not giving that patient chemotherapy. And then as you move into this intermediate category, uh, increase the size, increase the grade, perhaps lower one of the hormone receptor expression values, you start to see enormous amount of heterogeneity creeping into the decision making of individual doctors. And so we've got a, an obvious situation where patients, uh, it's a lottery in terms of what treatment patients get when they are in those in-between states with an intermediate prognosis and uh, a not obvious molecular signature as to whether they're going to get chemotherapy or not. And I think it's very interesting. Now, clearly we hope that, that in the future people will be able to rely on, on being, you know, providing a much more personalized approach using, using uh, you know, refined molecular techniques. But it seems at the moment that access to that is patchy 
and uh, uptake when there is access is patchy. Yeah, that's one of the issues I think in many countries is that the access to any uh, more sophisticated, if I can call it this way, uh, uh, pathological methodology is not accepted, uh, is not reimbursed, and uh, this is also true in Switzerland. We, we are still discussing and uh, thinking and pondering about pros and cons, and uh, uh, is it worth the effort, is it not worth the effort? Uh, um, and that, that's uh, an issue in a country which uh, seems to have not too many economical problems. Certainly an issue in many countries throughout Europe. Uh, what's the situation in the UK? Where do well, we the UK, stand in the UK? Just, we're, 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 in, we're just changing because uh, we have had a, a nice technology appraisal to look at molecular signatures and they, they've come up with the conclusion that the only uh, test that they, they'd be happy to invest in is, is the Oncotype DX test and they've been very prescriptive about exactly uh, what group of patients are appropriate for that test. We're now going through another round of refining, uh, even the NICE guidance being refined by the purchasers, so that's another delay whilst we cogitate upon all of that and there's consultation documents out there. But it does look like we are going to get access to this particular test for uh, patients who've got um, you know, pretty uh, slightly higher than intermediate prognosis and uh, where the, you know, where the projected uh, adjuvant benefit is going to be around about a five, a three percent uh, um, overall survival advantage over ten years, and in that group, uh, where it's where it's where it's over three percent as a, as a whole group, we will actually be allowed to use the test to determine uh, whether it's appropriate to to carry on. Obviously, in patients who've got no positive disease, uh, the test is not validated sufficiently, and we wouldn't be using it there. But this is for the no negative subpopulation, so it's coming, uh, and it'll be very interesting to see what difference that makes to the way we practice in the UK. Yeah, and uh, elsewhere because many countries are, are moving. But as we are still thinking and wondering about something that has been established for quite a while already. We have new techniques that are, uh, are arriving and uh, we have this once again big hope that we will be able to define some precise targets in the patient's tumors and uh, target those and that will make a big difference and everyone is excited about new generation sequencing and then we see papers appearing like in the Lancet Oncology recently from the French group showing that you have hundreds of patients as candidates and at the end you just have a few where actually you can uh, get any meaningful result and uh, possibly uh, do a so-called individualized treatment. So what's your take on this? Oh, well, I think it's a very exciting area. It's clearly a research-driven area. We don't, we don't yet know. It will take a lot of effort. And as, as you quite rightly say, uh, you, know, you are going to find that we will have target, you know, target, you know, mutations that are, that are drug targetable. Uh, and the targets, you know, the drugs will work, and we're going to have disappointments as well along the way. So, I suspect it's going to be very slow progress using the new technology to help us work out how to identify those patients and bring in personalised medicine. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time. It will take some time indeed, as it's taking still a lot of time to get already, as I mentioned, established techniques accepted as an important tool, even though they have been accepted, as we discussed, at major consensus meetings and have been put forward by the consensus panels. But I think the only way we will ever make uh, any progress is by continuing to explore all of these new exciting technologies with well-conducted trials to tell us how to use them. That's the only answer. Put your patients in a clinical trial. I agree with you. <laughs>